Today's video is part one of an ongoing series I'd like to share with you all. Uh, this awesome machine needs no introduction and I'm not even going to get into the history of it, but this is something I've always wanted to do with the PlayStation 2 for nearly 20 years now, ever since reading about it in a PlayStation magazine when I was a teenager. I could never afford it and convincing my parents to buy it just seemed like a silly idea. Since this time I've always dreamed about getting Linux running on my PlayStation 2. Although the official kit is pretty rare and hard to find, it also had many limitations and the price range of these kits just keeps soaring so not really an option for me. But thankfully to the open source community we have Black Rhino Linux, which is a live DVD that you can install to a hard drive. With that in mind, I went to eBay and started looking for network adapters and IDE hard drives. Now there is a list of drives that are compatible and there are definitely some you should avoid, but we will look into that a bit later. Just to get us started, I'm going to boot up the live DVD version just to see how it performs and we can compare it to the hard drive performance later. We will need free MC boot or free Mac boot or however you like to pronounce it to get Linux to boot up unofficially on the PlayStation 2. Free memory card boot is a software mod that allows you to run homebrew software without modifying the hardware. Using the uLaunch we're going to run the kernel loader to configure our settings and boot the Linux system. While the system loads I'd like to just point out some interesting observations and stuff I noticed along the way so you can sort of follow this journey in real time. Now that Kloader is launched, you can get to the boot and configuration menu here. You can browse the DVD to see where the kernel and virtual system is that we will be running from the DVD. The best way to run the system is to load the configuration from the DVD and Kloader will launch the Linux kernel and start the boot process. You can actually explore the file system of the DVD here. Um, what they've basically done is this DVD registers on the PlayStation 2 like a normal movie DVD, which allows the K-Loader to access the CD file system. Okay, so let's boot Linux. Now, nothing much of interest really happens during the boot process, but it's pretty cool to see that the kernel displays the MIPS CPU running at a raging 294 MHz, and that the Linux kernel is version 2.4. It also says that the PlayStation 2 sound driver is being initialized, but it's actually a different module you have to get from the official kit or an older version of Black Rhino, which I'm not really sure why they removed it from out of the box use. So we will be booting without sound. During the boot process, it also detects my USB Apple keyboard and didn't seem to like the hub that comes with it. So it displays a few errors. At this point, the swap partitioning is also being activated, which is important for a system with only 32 megabytes of memory, and only about 30 of them can be seen by Linux. And the Ethernet port is being probed but not found, which is rather curious. And here are the errors I mentioned before about my Apple keyboard, which I decided to use so I could plug a mouse into it using the inbuilt hub to save on USB ports. At this point, the controllers are loaded into the system, which basically gives you rudimentary navigation input of the system, but does not make it easy to input text. Black Rhino Linux does come with an on-screen keyboard, but it's easier to use just a normal keyboard. Linux is probing for the Ethernet card, but is unable to find it here because I forgot to enable it in the Kloader settings, which I'm pretty sure it's disabled by default for some reason.
side note is that in the official kit you needed a special VGA adapter to run the system but in this version it's set to the composite out at a staggering 640 by 240 resolution. Now even if we had one of the official VGA adapters, like Rhino Linux won't actually boot with that adapter. Finally, after all that, we are greeted with the Fluxbox user interface, which is pretty low end and simple, but it works pretty well considering the specs of the PlayStation 2. The distro also comes with Window Maker, the other user interface, but we'll check that out on a later date. I wanted to have a quick play around with the system and found out pretty quickly that the word quick may not have been the right word to use. So I brought up the main menu for a quick look at the available programs and apps on the live DVD. And out of curiosity, I wanted to have a quick look around the file system and it actually took about 50 seconds to a minute for Pathfinder to load from the DVD. Even back when this machine was new, that was still painfully slow. So after that extremely painful uh, experience and not being able to get online, I rebooted the system and added the network adapter settings in Kloader. The network adapter was working this time and I decided to run a ping back to my router. I even had a look on the router and it comes up as Black Rhino Linux, which I thought was pretty cool. It took around 40 seconds to load the terminal just so I could run the ping and I thought to myself there is just no hope of running Firefox from the live DVD in this current state. So I went for Dillo for the time being. Now if you are into retro computing online, the old net is always a cool place to test your system and leave a quick hello. By this point I would sort of convinced myself that the only way forward in this uh, series is to get Linux installed onto the hard drive because using the live DVD is just way too painful. Just too slow and it's just painful. Like so painful, I can't even I can't even describe how painful it is. After playing around with the live DVD, I was pretty much ready to rip my hair out as it was just way too slow to use and experiment with. So my only option is to install the hard drive via the network adapter and then prepare the drive for use for Linux and running games from it. Also something important to note here is that some drives like this Western Digital will not connect to the PlayStation 2 network adapter due to the weird orientation of the power and the IDE connector. You can see here side by side with the Seagate drive, the difference is pretty obvious. Luckily I had another drive laying around. And it's also important to set the drive to master or cable select or the drive will not register. So as you see there, the Western Digital drive does not line up and the Seagate one here lines up perfectly so let's get that installed and boot the system. Okay, open up ulaunch and we're going to navigate to the miscellaneous folder and we're going to open up the hard drive manager that comes bundled with ulaunch. You'll see on the top left even though the drive is connected is not detected by the hard drive manager. If you try to format it or change anything on it, uh, nothing's going to happen. You can initially set the drive up with WinHip, but there is an easier way to do it from the machine itself. We can actually wake the drive up using the open PS2 loader, which will activate the drive and the activity LED will actually come on as the drive is being initialized. As there's no games on this drive, uh, nothing shows up, but now that the hard drive is actually activated, you can go back to the hard drive manager in new launch, and you'll actually see the status of connected is now a yes. So we can actually format and partition this hard drive and get it ready for playing games and running Linux. Awesome, there we go. 
Yes, it's connected. Yes, it's formatted. And now it's recognized by the ULaunch HDD Manager. Okay, so this is all done now and we can actually load up the live DVD through Kloader and start partitioning the drive for use with Linux. This actually requires a PS2 specific version of FDisk which allows you to create the partitions. I learned this the hard way after multiple attempts of using the standard FDisk program and wondered why it wouldn't write the partition tables and save the information, which was really infuriating. We're going to need to create a swap partition and root drive. There isn't a whole lot of information about running Linux on a PS2 apart from a few forums and a bit of independent research. So hopefully this video helps, but I actually followed this video here, which helped me so much in setting up hard drives. And for the swap drive, you can get away with using 128 megabytes. That'll be plenty, but I'm going to use 256. I wanted to save a bit of room for my PlayStation game, so I'm only going to set this hard drive to be 2 gig for the primary system. We've got our swap drive and our root system and we will activate them and write the partition table and then we will use mkswap and mkfs to set up the file system types and the drives will then be recognized by the system. <laughs> Setting up the file system may take a little bit of time, so make a coffee or do the dishes or something productive in the meantime. And now the drive is recognized by the system and ready to go. thing we need to do is mount the drive and then start transferring the old root system to the new root system of the PlayStation 2. This will actually take a bit of time so go make a coffee. The last thing we need to do is set up the drives to be mounted at startup. So we need to edit the fstab file and then reboot the system. This is how I've set my one up and I've also got it mounting the first USB drive as a VFAT partition at SDA1. Once that's saved we can reboot into the kernel loader and make the final changes needed to boot from the hard disk. We're going to go into the kernel parameters to change the boot device to HDA2 just like this. 
depending on where you copy the system to, it could be HDA 1, 2, or 3, or even SDA 1, 2, 3 if you install to a USB drive, which I wouldn't really recommend as it's just too slow. And just another side note, I apologize about some of the capture quality of the PlayStation 2 footage. Um, the resolution is really, really low. And if you can't see the um, steps where I did the F-Disc and uh, partitioning and all that, um, you can follow this link here where I got the information from, just to get a little bit clearer. That's it for this video. There's still more to come yet. Uh, we have to explore the Black Rhino distribution to see what it's capable of. And at a later date, I want to try Debian and maybe some other distributions. Just remember that this is for fun, I'm still learning and I hope this video helps you and if you have any hints or tips please leave a comment below and I will see you guys on the next video. Thanks for watching.